Well, it's good afternoon, everybody, attending the um, webinar about Mauritius and people wanting to investigate, investing there, or living there, or retiring there. On behalf of Brentus Wealth, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody, and we have more than 600 people who registered for the webinar today. It's an hour and a half, and it's filled with up-to-date news on what is happening in Mauritius as far as quarantine is concerned, flights, investment opportunities, setting up of offices, investing in property. And we have a lineup of speakers. And I'll start with um, Gavin Butchard. He's the head of Brent Wealth. It's an affiliate company of Brent Wealth on the island and has been there for three years. And, 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 and Gavin has been with the group since day one. And then we will be joined by Joel Bruno, an old friend, and he's head of well, he's a managing director of Medine Property, which is one of the largest property developers, especially on the southwest part of the island. So if you're traveling around that area, you're probably crossing and traversing Medine Property uh, quite often, and you'll see it all around. And Medine is at the forefront of some very exciting developments on the island, and he'll be talking about that when his turn comes to speak. And then we're very pleased to announce or to invite for us Rojit, who is the head of the Financial Services Cluster at the Mauritian Economic Development Board. Um, for us is uh, Mauritian, but well-traveled, well-studied all over the world with a glittering career in government and also at the United Nations. He's an expert as to what is happening on the island. So I'm going to kick off the presentation or my presentation with a quick warm uh, warm up as to what Mauritius beckons and, and, and can offer people on the island. And I have to make a confession, and people know this, I have had a love-hate relationship with Mauritius for a very long time, in fact, more than 30 years, been visiting the island, going on some fantastic holidays, staying at magnificent hotels, magnificent beaches, and then, of course, lately became an investor myself in property and various property developments on the island and setting up of offices operate from the from the island. So the question is, why would you consider Mauritius either as an investment opportunity or as a place to invest in property? So let's um, let me see if I can move on with my slides. And we have a slight technical problem. I do beg your pardon. We have a slight problem with the with the slides. Um, right, there we have it. As I said, this is the agenda today. I am the first speaker. I'll be talking for about 10 minutes or so. Gavin Butchard, Brent Wealth, Joel Bruno, and Faraz Rajit is from the Precious Economic Development Board. Just a very brief introduction to the Brent Wealth offering on the island, and, and Gavin is going to be talking about this in greater detail. We um, offer a full range of financial services, including forex trading, opening up of forex accounts, tax clearance certificates, administration with regards to forex, um, residency and work permits. And I've been told that, that Gavin and his team is inundated with South Africans considering working and living on the island, either as uh, on, a, on an occupational basis or as a retiree, also involved in development and, and searching for commercial and residential investment property and opening up of bank accounts. I'll be talking about that later. We deal with most of the large banks in on, on the island, including Mauritius Commercial Bank, Afriasia, and also Investec. Setting up of trust and structures, appointment of trustees, and, and lastly, administration of companies, et cetera. I think by all by now, many South Africans know that Mauritius has, 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 has been a rising star as far as uh, an, an investment and, and financial center is concerned. And it has all the right elements, apart from its natural beauty, uh, to become a world-class investment destination. Recently voted by New World Wealth, which is a South African-based research company, as the safest country in Southern Africa, along with Namibia and Botswana. And, and for many South Africans, 
this is very, very important, especially considering the high crime rate in South Africa and the recent uh, unrest in KwaZulu-Natal and parts of Gauteng. So the safety of Mauritius vitally important, and I can, I can testify, having lived there for many, many years, for long periods on end, that safety is not a major concern when you live on the island and what you used to in South Africa, regrettably. It's also an easy place to do business. It's ranked first in Africa and, and, and based on many surveys, 2018, 2019, of, of doing business in Africa. So easy place to operate, open an account, start a business and get cracking. And on a world basis, it's ranked 25. And what's important is this ranking has been improving all the time that over the last five, 10, even 15 years. So Mauritius is trying very, very hard to make it an easy place to do business. Uh, they wish to attract business people to the island, investors to the island, and people to set up a lifestyle on the island. And there are many other rankings where Mauritius has overtaken South Africa in many respects. We're not going to deal on all of them, but it is something to consider if you are considering Mauritius as a destination. The situation in South Africa, as I've been writing for many, many years, unfortunately, we are in a, a, a very difficult financial uh, situation. The economy has not grown for, for many, many years. In fact, the last 10 years have been one of the worst periods for South Africa from an economic perspective. This, today on, on, on MoneyWeb, there was an article written by Mike Sushler, the consulting economist of Brentus Wealth, about how manufacturing is disappearing from South Africa, whereas manufacturing now is barely 12% of GDP, and 30 years ago it was 24%. So that is another indicator that things are not well in South Africa. And even top-rated journalists and editors and publications are starting to ask the question, is South Africa investable? Who dares invest in South Africa now? And these kind of articles, ladies and gentlemen, would have been fairly unique or rare uh, up, up until the recent riots. So even Rob Rose, the editor of the Financial Mail, is starting to ask um, very, very serious questions about South Africa as an investment destination. And it's our function to our clients to give them as much information as possible to base their investment decisions. I want to end off my part of the presentation on the story, the fictitious story, but in real life, there are many examples of this. The tale of local Lenny and offshore Otto. Let's call them two twins. They both 10 years ago inherited 10 million rand each. Now, local Lenny decided to leave all his money in South Africa and invested in the local portfolio of funds. He bought a property on a golfing estate and he had some money in cash. And doing all the numbers, and, and this will be on our website and everybody will get this, that 10 million rand invested, 10 million rand or 10 years ago today, if you do the numbers, you do the currency conversions, you add in the dividends and interest, is worth 19.3 million rand today. So local any not bad, but really not grown capital faster than the domestic inflation rate in South Africa. Had this person taken some money offshore and in, made with the same inheritance, converted that money to dollars, you gave, you got $1.428 million. You invested in the same ratio in an offshore portfolio, Franklin Opportunities Fund, Fidelity Healthcare Fund, the Brentus Global Balance Fund, our own fund that's 10 years old. Your current value today is 29.2 million rand as opposed to the 12 million then with the local investment. Had you now taken the balance of your dollars and bought a property, and in this case, I speak from experience, you'd invested in Mauritius or London or any other place, and also had 10% in cash, as any good investment advisor will tell you, the rand value of that same investment, 10 years later, ladies and gentlemen, is 43 million rand, as opposed to the 
for someone who did not externalize assets. So the point I am trying to make with this hypothetical story, which might not be hypothetical at all, because a lot of our clients have taken our advice and externalized the assets and they bought property in Mauritius, London, United States, invested offshore. They are significantly wealthier today on a global scale than local auto or local Lenny who decided to stick with these local investments. And this is over a period of only 10 years. So I don't know what the next 10 years will hold, ladies and gentlemen, but at least one needs to consider that it can be a repeat of the same. Our stock market is under pressure. The currency in particular is going to be under pressure in the next five years, in my view, and some of the research that we've done. Um, so with that, I'd like to underline the fact that externalizing some of your assets has made imminent sense over the last 10 years from a financial point of view. A lot of people also considering externalizing their assets and themselves from a political and a safety point of view. And with that, I end, I'm going to hand you over to Gavin Butchard, who runs Brent Wealth on the island. And then straight after that, we'll go to Joel Bruno, we'll talk about property, and then Faraz Rojit from the um, Economic Development Board. From me, it's goodbye until later. Thank you, Magnus. Um, and it's uh, great to be one of the panelists on this uh, webinar. I'm also just going to quickly share my screen. Uh, so I hope that everyone uh, can see that. Um, sorry, I just want to do this quickly. Um, there we go. So I hope everyone can see that. So we've been getting the question as to why Mauritius, and I think Magnus has touched on some of the reasons as to why it's become more and more attractive, uh, being number one, being close to South Africa and Africa, if you still have family business interests, it's a hop, skip, and you're back in South Africa and vice versa. So it's, it's a good, good well-positioned uh, island in terms of Africa. Um, so that's, that's the first reason, but uh, I'm going to move through some other reasons as to why Mauritius is a plan B, and it's, it's generating, and Magnus is quite correct, we've been inundated with inquiries and questions regarding investment, moving to Mauritius, setting up businesses, moving family, uh, can I live there? I've been here for four years with my family, um, and we love it. Um, and we're looking forward to, to, to seeing a lot more South Africans coming back to the island, including Magnus, uh, shortly, I believe. So why, why is Mauritius a plan B? Uh, and basically, Mauritius is, is politically and economically stable. It's a broad-based economy. It used to be a mono economy in terms of agriculture. It's got good governance. As I mentioned, it's the gateway through to Africa. Um, it, it allows you to jump on a plane. You're not sitting in Australia, the UK. You can, you can jump on a plane, and in four hours, you're basically back in Johannesburg and into Africa. Low crime rate, as Magnus mentioned, and unemployment rates. It's competitive and has an attractive tax jurisdiction. Um, it is well. It has a well-regulated international financial centre. Um, it has a good education system. I've got this question quite a few times from families that are looking to move to Mauritius. There's the Cambridge education system that's offered uh, for the English-speaking uh, students in Mauritius. Uh, I have two children, and they both go to, to one of the international schools here, a very good school. Uh, there's good medical facilities and services, and it's a vibrant, safe lifestyle. Just a few facts regarding Mauritius. Uh, historically, as I mentioned, they were a predominantly agricultural uh, country, uh, which accounted for largely sugar. And I'm sure Joel is going to touch on, on Medina and uh, the property they have and what they're moving into. Um, but obviously, sugar has been, been given a bit of a bad rap in terms of it's bad for us. And it, it, it has been taxed quite heavily in other countries. Um, so what the, the government and the EDB have, have have done is they've started to see other industries and grow other industries within Mauritius. And there's definitely scope for that and opportunity for that, specifically in the financial tourism sector has always been there. There's about 1.3 million people on the island. 
and about the same amount visit the island every year. Every year. This is pre-COVID. The industrial industry is also growing. The manufacturing industry has, has been one which is, is maybe opposite to that article that Magnus mentioned. Um, from a Mauritian point of view, it has been a major contributor over the last 20 years. And, and I think that was more to do with the introduction of the free port zones and the incentives around the manufacturing sector. So it's become quite attractive for companies that are in this manufacturing industries that can move their, their offices and their, their businesses to Mauritius and, and import and export from Mauritius using the free port zones, which is quite attractive. And I'm sure Faraz from the EDB is going to touch on that. And then we've also seen a notable growth coming from the construction industry within Mauritius. Um, in turn, in, as well as from the public sector in the last budget, they're going to inject quite a lot into the infrastructure. We've seen it already um, being uh, injected. And we're seeing a lot of cranes around Mauritius, which is a good, good sign for any economy. Um, just, a, just a note and a point that, which, which I came across, and you'll see in the second quarter, this is the GDP number that grew by 18.8%, um, you know, which, which is quite, quite amazing, because that's the strongest growth since 2001. Obviously, this is largely due to the COVID-related uh, lockdown and, and industries such as your hotels and restaurants, which are now filling up now that the borders are open once again to fully vaccinated travelers. Transportation and storage, uh, obviously manufacturing, as I've mentioned, um, again, with the construction and mining coming through, which is creating that good GDP number. So we hope that that will continue going forward. Um, it's also good to mention some of the sectors or the key sectors within Mauritius, which maybe some people aren't aware of, um, that may be in those particular sectors in their respective countries, be it South Africa, and they want to, again, moving, move their businesses across. Um, so some of the key, key sectors in Mauritius are the agro uh, industry. Again, it was uh, a monocrop, which was predominantly your sugar cane. That's now moved to a multitude of foods that are being produced locally and exported, um, although we do import quite a bit as well, being a small island. Um, from a creative industry point of view, um, there is a good film rebate. So if there, anybody's in the film or creative industry, that is a good one that the EDB is also promoting and the government are promoting to come and do your, your or produce your, your films in Mauritius um, and you'll get good incentives in, in, that, in that industry. The ocean economy, I believe that um, the Indian Ocean holds the largest stock of tuna, Mauritius, uh, no exception. I'm still to catch one of those elusive tunas, but uh, I hope one day I'll get on a boat and do that. Um, but the aquaculture, uh, there's an eight-year tax incentive or tax holiday. Um, there's also VAT and duty exemptions in terms of the ocean economy. Education, we get about 70... Uh, Besides the local uh, students, there's about 70 countries or se students from 70 countries that come to Mauritius. Um, there's an international education system, as mentioned before. That's growing. You can also invest in the, internet, in the education system, uh, again, with, with incentives that come with that. Um, the renewable energy, this is what everyone seems to be talking about lately, and Mauritius is ahead in, in terms of this. Uh, the target is between 40 and 60 percent to, to have more green energy by 2030. Again, any businesses looking in or are in this industry, be it solar businesses, can come and invest. Um, and as well as households. So your own individual households, um, there are tax in incentives for, for those um, businesses and households. From the financial services, sorry, uh, it's extremely stable and transparent. As I said, there's good governments. They're here, adhering to the OECD. Um, I will touch briefly on the EU listing, uh, which has been in the media, and I'm sure Faraz from the EDB may uh, mention this as well. Um, and they, they cater, in terms of financial services, they cater for your company. There's about 19 different banks in the island. Bank Vegas has, has mentioned this. There's finance available. Uh, in terms of onshore and offshore, and then the taxation side of it comes in as well. In terms of your free port, um, 
Freeport is, is going hand in hand with your import and your export of goods. This is another sector which the government is promoting uh, quite well. Um, and we're seeing it from the manufacturing. It also goes into the manufacturing. If you're producing your product on the island and then exporting that out of Mauritius, your, your, your company tax can go from a 15% down to 3% on exported goods. And then you can have VAT and duty free on your imported product or raw materials. So as you can see, there's, there's just a lot of incentives in every sector that the government and the EDB are trying to promote to get the investment into Mauritius and promote Mauritius, and they're doing the right things. From a healthcare point of view, um, they are attracting a lot of professionals and specialists and services, as well as companies looking to build hospitals, invest, and again, additional tax incentives in both these areas. ITC, which is your IT-related uh, um, industry, there's a variety of uh, incentives, incentives and services here. Again, looking to grow this industry as it's, an, it's a continually growing industry and forever changing in terms of technology. Um, so new skills, technology to the island, again, will create uh, additional incentives should you wish to move to the island. It also allows you to work remotely um, with, with IT. Um, your real estate and hospitality, uh, Joel uh, will be touching on smart city developments, which is a great concept in terms of Mauritius, um, with the main idea of live, work, play, and learn. So you effectively are born um, in the smart city and you leave the smart city when you, when you go to the, the clouds in the sky, as they say. The, the good one to, to note is the residency permit that now comes for foreigners or non-citizens. That was 500,000 historically, that's been dropped to 375. And as long as you're keeping your property, your permanent residency will go along with that. Um, so the property and the permanent residency goes hand in hand. Life sciences, uh, this is just another sector within Mauritius and again being promoted quite uh, well and, uh, and we're seeing a lot of traction coming in from the pharmaceutical and cosmetic industries um, and a lot of opportunity in this sector to grow within Mauritius. The manufacturing, as I mentioned before, um, in terms of all the sectors, in terms of manufacturing, there's a lot um, of incentives across this particular sector. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's the same um, sort of feel going through all the sectors that the incentives are, and the, are, are to drive the investment into Mauritius, potentially moving your head office here, making this the home and, and benefiting from all these incentives that the, the government is offering at the moment. On the sports economy, opportunities to promote and develop the sports in Mauritius. I think this is a fantastic, uh, uh, I, I like my rugby and I believe there's a potential up and coming Mauritian rugby team and I hope that's true. Um, so that'll be good to, to see going forward as well. So there's a lot of um, energy and effort going into making all these sectors more attractive. So if any of the clients sitting outside of Mauritius um, fall into any of these sectors, there's plenty of opportunity because people always ask us, what are the opportunities? And there's plenty, depending on the sectors you're in. Um, in terms of the schemes, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the schemes um, that are available, but there are a lot of schemes available in Mauritius. Um, again, this attracting investment, be it... Um, you know, the, the main one that we're seeing being uh, used at the moment by clients is the Smart City Scheme and the Property Development Scheme. This replaced the old IRS and RES developments um, where you would buy into your property either as an investment property. You can purchase a property for less than the 375. It just doesn't give you that residency. Um, and that would be potentially a holiday home, an investment property where you can receive your passive income in an offshore property. So those are some of the schemes that you can, can invest into or look at. Um, again, these are constantly changing and, and they are progressive. 
Um, so we're definitely seeing positive things coming out of the government um, in terms of investment into Mauritius and the opportunities again for foreigners and non-citizens. Just in terms of the uh, permits, um, there are various permits uh, available. So this is why we've been inundated and I'm sure we're gonna get quite a few questions in terms of the seminar, but everyone's different in terms of their needs, what they're doing. So there's different permit requirements, there's different schemes and there's, there's definitely different sectors that you can invest from into and get the benefits from those. Just some of those, those uh, permits that are available to, to non-citizens and foreigners in Mauritius at the moment, uh, you have your, your property and commercial. We are allowed to buy certain commercial property that is available to us as non-citizens and foreigners. Um, so that's, that's a good one to, to have in the back of your mind as well. If anyone's into commercial property, the yield is, is good on that. And I'm happy to, to speak to anyone interested in that sector. Um, there's the investor permit, self-employed, the occupation permit. Um, and we've seen quite a few changes uh, in the last budget again to encourage and promote skilled professionals and talent to come to the island. The retirement permit is also available. So it's not all about business for those of you that like to retire in a safe, peaceful country. Um, Mauritius is potentially that, that place. And uh, the retirement age for Mauritius is 15 years. Um, that is the retirement age. There's also the premium visas, which I'm sure uh, Faraz will again touch on, which is a newer visa available to foreigners. Um, just, just to mention the Economic Development Board, and, um, and uh, basically everything we do on the island, uh, be it start a business, buy a property, uh, apply for a permit, we have to go through the EDB, which is the Economic Development Board, and we, we require their approval to, to live, work, play, and live on the island. So that is just a note to let you know we do need to have that application and that process to, to come to the island and effectively start up your business, work, and, and any applications that you do go through the EDB. Um, Mauritius is again also very attractive for those those clients that, that can work um, remotely um, due to the fact that the infrastructure in Mauritius is very good from the IT point of view and growing as mentioned earlier again close to to Africa and South Africa for those clients that still have business um, within Africa and South Africa and then also those clients that are looking to actually relocate their headquarters to the island. Um, that's also available and can be done, and which we've done for quite a few of our clients. There's obviously also a very attractive regime on offer to, to Mauritians, uh, sorry, to foreigners and Mauritians. Um, so the, generally your company tax is 15%. As I said, you could get it down to 3% depending on the sector you're in and the incentives offered, um, you can get that down to 3%. Company tax is 15%. Individual tax is 15%. Um, there is solidarity tax. So there's a few other taxes that have come through in the, in the budget and due to COVID, but we, we can obviously work through those and explain those for any of those clients that, that are in the higher brackets above the 3 million rupee mark per annum. Some of the good, Good um, points is there's no capital gains tax in Mauritius, there's no estate duty, there's no rates and taxes on your property that you buy in, in Mauritius. Uh, no dividends tax if it's below 3 million. And there's numerous, numerous tax holidays and incentives for investors and companies. And as I said, there's quite a long list um, which I would work through individual investors and, and clients looking to relocate their offices to Mauritius. Just touching quickly on the EU listing, um, Mauritius was put on the, the blacklist. Um, however, we've had the due diligence. And we've had um, guys come out from, from the EU that have done their due diligence in Mauritius. I believe we've ticked a lot of the boxes. Um, we are complying with international standards in terms of the OECD. Um, 
So I feel that we're probably going to be off this list by the end of October. I hope Faraz is going to agree with me on that. And I'm sure he's going to touch on that more um, as he's got more insight into terms of the EU listing. So from the EU listing, uh, it looks like we're going to move back into a whitelist, which is very positive for the country going forward. As mentioned by Magnus, um, on the island, um, we assist a lot of clients in relocating, moving to the island, moving their funds um, offshore. We have a, a forex service on the island as well. Just to make mention, there's no exchange control in Mauritius as well, so it allows you for the free flow of, of funds. Um, and I believe you can have up to 18 different currencies. So you can hold up to 18 different currencies as well in Mauritius. So not necessarily Mauritius, you can hold dollars, sterling, or any of the other currencies available to us. So we do have a, a forex service in terms of assisting clients in moving their funds offshore into the various platforms, um, and we can help with that. That's no problem at all. We also assist clients, as mentioned by Magnus, with, with some of the foreign following uh, services with the assistance of a management company on the island, they are partners, um, and they help us in terms of assisting clients once they've come across in terms of identifying the different investment or scheme or structure that they're looking for specifically. As I said, everyone may be different or is different in terms of what they're looking for, their needs. Um, and we go through every single client and obviously assist them where we can. Um, and these are some of the services again, in partnership with our management company that we offer to our clients in helping them have a smooth, easy transition across to the island um, when, 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 uh, when they make that decision to, to come. So basically that, that is um, my presentation in terms of brand wealth uh, on the island. Uh, so thank you very much, Magnus, uh, for the opportunity to, to speak to everyone. And hopefully I've, I've got the message across and, uh, and they're more than welcome to give us a call if it's property, commercial property, or any of the other services that we offer, we, we're more than willing to help. Thank you, Gavin. And um, I'm gonna hand you straight across to Joel who's the MD of Mandine, one of the largest property developers and landowners on the island. And there are many South Africans who bought in Mauritius. Over the years, we bought uh, on the west coast uh, of, of Mauritius and you know, around the, the Bryce fires, we call it the Bura Monaco. So we, we sit and talk rugby while we're in Mauritius and we, we, we bribe Buravos and, and the rum steaks from, from Karnheim. So yes, thank you for that. So I'm going to hand you over to Joe for those who are interested in property as an investment, as a vehicle to get onto the island. So I hand you over to Joel. Thanks, Magnus. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, my name is Joel. I'm an MD of uh, Median Property. I just I, I won't I won't bore you with details of, of a company. What's important is talk about is talk about um, our products, but. Just to reassure you about who Medin is, so we are we are a company which is more than 100 years old. Can doesn't can sound like a bad idea, but we are listed on the exchange. Management is is a uh, fully fully educated and and and, and new and young, uh, even though the company is 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 old. We are um, publicly listed on the on the stock exchange, and um, a very notable shareholder of, of Medin is the Mauritius Commercial Bank, the MCB, which is a, a, a sizable shareholder in, in the company. So, in terms of, 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 of good governance, we are we are, I would say, among among the among the best uh, rated here. Our our if you want main businesses are property development, uh, obviously, um, sugar and agriculture. I think Magnus or Gavin pointed out that uh, Mauritius move from a single crop economy now to a diversified economy. Medin was among the big landowners. So we, sugar has been our prime business for quite a while. And agriculture as well, obviously now we're looking for more uh, refined and high value uh, production. We are also uh, involved in, in leisure and tourism. Obviously, as you can imagine, this, this sector was um, um, hit by, by the COVID pandemic. We own a boutique hotel uh, near Tamarina Golf, Golf Estates, uh, but we also own the golf and operate the golf, Tamarina Golf and Casella um, uh, Adventure Park. 
We are also involved in the education sector. Uh, you will see a bit later. We we have um, we have a quite a large portion of our development in our smart city orient, oriented on the education sector, where we have schools and, and uh, universities now being set up. Um, Medin, as I just um, mentioned to you, we own our land bank is is larger than ten thousand hectares, which is roughly about six percent of the Mauritius territory. So. Uh, from Tamarin, Flican Flac, Albion, most of the land neighboring major conurbations, from Curvip to almost Paul Wee, uh, our land, basically, if you go to the west, at some point in time, you will have to drive on Midian land. Um, being, be, be it you going towards Tamarin or Flican Flac or even Albion, you will be basically on Midian land. Medin has been pioneer in major real estate projects. Um, we, we were the first one to start the IRS. The Marina Gulf Estate uh, IRS, which was the first project which opened the residential properties to foreigners. So very much, uh, very much pioneering uh, real estate in the West. And uh, Tamarina uh, today, as, as you perhaps know, is quite a leading and, and a successful uh, uh, project with its golf and its, its villas. Um, al alongside with Tamarina, not far from Tamarina, we've, we've developed since, nine, since uh, uh, 2009, 2009, 2010, 2011, uh, the Cascavel node, typically today comprising of Cascavel Mall, which is a retail center. Uh, now uh, we are looking at um, increasing, increasing the, um, that phase to 30,000 square meter, from 12,000 to 30,000 square, just to show that the, the, the West is actually kind of um, Kind of booming in terms of demand. We have a lot of, requ of requests now from, from um, country retailers like uh, what you call re regional retailers in South Africa wanting to, to move down to the west in our, in our project. So obviously now we're just going to double the size, looking at doubling the size. We have developed also Office Park. Uh, today we are at the 18,000 uh, square meter jelly. We have offshore management companies set up in there, which can tally a bit with, with uh, Brento's business. Uh, we have also um, uh, South African, large South African supply chain companies, um, quite notable as well at, at, by any size, very large, based, based in our business park. We have also developed schools and universities. We have West Coast primary and secondary schools, which are IB based uh, school. We have uh, Middlesex University. We have also French universities setting up uh, in, our, in our ecosystem, uh, education ecosystem. We've developed also like a um, sports center. Uh, we have uh, developed a eight hectare, eight hectare um, sports center, which today caters for rugby, soccer, swimming, gym, futsal, tennis. So it's quite, quite a lifestyle component which Medina has, has invested into just to be able to get people to, uh, welcoming people and live around and inside uh, that development uh, scheme. Um, we, uh, Gavin touched up about uh, the smart city. Medin was among the first one to receive a smart city scheme, which is mainly, if you want a fiscal, fiscal, fiscalized incentive or incentivized fiscal arrangement where people buying or developing the smart city get uh, fiscal advantages, typically uh, that exemption at 15% coming to zero can be quite interesting in terms of development, but also corporate tax uh, incentive where you get a tax holiday of eight years from the date of our license to the time that you develop your project and you actually can put it in the market and get your profit. And this is exempt from tax, taxation. So what, 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 is, what, what are smart cities, and in our case, Unicity? These are uh, mixed use development, which in our case is about Cascavel, it's around Cascavel. Cascavel is very much, if you want, like a, the roundabout of the West. So it, all the traffic coming from the center of Ireland, coming from the south or the north, it has to come from Cascavel. So at that very node here, we are uh, staging a, a mixed use development, um, which is a master plan of a 350 hectares. So it's quite a large development, which uh, today, as I was saying a bit earlier on, comprises a retail center, um, business park and, and other things. So today, what, what will be the opportunities? So essentially they are threefold. You will have uh, buyers, I would say, uh, and, and users, typically buyers of built up units, but either we will build or our partners will build. So these will be apartments, uh, townhouses, and villas. In our case, we just put on, put on the market now um, a project of 49 units. So it's not a big project, but it's 49 units comprising like um, townhouses, 
uh, villas and apartments. These are off plan, off plan sales and it's to be on the market. We have, um, obviously we are going to work uh, via brand test as enablers for that sales, but we also have our um, local, um, local person based in Cape Town who is joining us soon as well. And she's coming to Mauritius, but she will come, go back and forth to, to South Africa from here. Um, these are, as I said, like off, off plan sales. Uh, right now out of 49, We've uh, reached, I would say, almost 60% sales. So there's only 40% left uh, on the market. Once we get to the break-even point, we'll, we'll push a button to get started the construction. Uh, as, as a individual buyers, as a um, end user as well, and buyer, uh, we also have service land for residential purposes. In the past, um, this wasn't mentioned, I think, by, by Gavin, but uh, foreign people acquiring uh, residential real estate in Mauritius could not actually acquire land. They could only acquire built-up units. In our situation, in our in the smart city, uh, land is also available. Our service plots are made available for, for expatriates. I want to stress on expatriates. So typically, being a foreign person living abroad, you don't have access to, to land. You can buy built-up units, but you, can't, you don't have access to land. Only the expatriates having a, a permit uh, living in, and working in Mauritius, either a retiree or a professional or someone who, who is living here on a, on a permit has access to, to, to the land. From that land, he can build his own house if he wants, or he can build the unit or units if he wants, as if he, if he buys many plots, and he can resell his build up units to whoever he wants, living in Mauritius or living abroad. So it's quite an, enlar an, an enlargement in the market. So it's not if you want to constrain to people living here or people buying built up, once a local foreigner buy the land, you can develop it, build, build a villa or an apartment and you can actually uh, sell it abroad to anyone he wants. So the market gets wider when we get to the smart city. Um, in terms of, it, yeah, I just said about the, um, the, the local expat buying land. In terms of, of developers, what we have, we have large service plots for, for, for third party developers. Typically in the smart city, we have earths, or, or which we, I mean, we obviously broke, broken down the smart city into, into uh, various plot of lands, some being commercial, some being industrial, others being residential. So we have this, um, this plot of lands which have been earmarked, and these are now offered on the market to, um, to developers. Typically, you will come to see us and we'll agree on the, if you want uh, architect impression and uh, construction constraints, and then this plus will be sold to you. And then from that, from these constraints, you will be able to actually uh, construct your own project and put it on the market to your clients. And obviously, uh, when you const when you build uh, the project, you will have to uh, respect the Kaili Shah's of call here or the architect um, architect guidelines. Um, typically, there are, there are places where we want the, uh, the smart city to be uh, more more dense, so you will have more apartments. And there are the places where we feel that it's more it's, it's, it's more ripe for villas or townhouses. So you will have to actually uh, adhere to, to, the, to this cahier de charge. Um, the good thing about the smart city, which also is worth mentioning, if you register yourself as a developer, if you have a large development, you are uh, de facto exempted from VAT in terms of the construction cost. In Mauritius, as a, as a property developer, you, Cost uh, VAT is, is part of your cost. Obviously, hence you have to put it back onto the selling price. In the smart city, the 15% is refunded to the developers. So this is quite an advantage, having your building cost uh, reduced by 15%. Uh, and if you create a joint vent or a SPV, like a special purpose vehicle for that project, um, you will be able to get a tax exemption, a corporate tax exemption on the profit that you made from that project. So obviously, if you have the advice I would give here is to, uh, in our in our situation, we will not obviously uh, sell like small plots, like one acre or so. We will rather uh, uh, engage in discussion to build. I would say nothing less than ten acre, ten acre, which is about essentially about four hectares, uh, and then from that you can actually uh, do your project, close it off, and whatever profit you will make in that project will be exempt from taxes which is also 15% as, uh, as Gavin mentioned a bit earlier on. Uh, we have also land, service land, which we are looking at offering for, for buildings, buildings, building schools, hospitals, senior residences, like um, old age homes, 
but more, more senior residences and then commercial ventures, student housing, and this kind of projects. In some situation, Medin will be keen as well to enter some JV with potentially developers. But this, as you, as you can imagine, it will be subject to board approval because we don't want to get involved in a kind of various project which we don't understand how, how, how it all operates. But yes, JV uh, has been contemplated in some point in time, but it has to go through scrutiny of our board and our assessment of, of, of the project itself. We have also, uh, uh, last uh, and at least, we have space for, for offices as tenants, not, not developers, not buyers, but more tenants. We have offices to rent. We have uh, uh, Cascavel Mall, as I was telling you, um, is going to be increased to um, almost 30,000 30, square meter out of, 20, of 12 existing today. So the market will open as well on for the retailers in that region of Ireland. Uh, on my side, uh, I think I brushed up, um, I, I tried to brush up the totality of, 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 of Medin project. Please feel free to contact uh, Gavin or Magnus on our projects. Uh, they are going to work with us on, on, on that or some aspect of that large <coughs> uh, development. And uh, uh, back to you, Magnus. Well, thank you very much. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm flying out next week to go and, and go and visit the island. I haven't been there since the lockdown. It's almost two years now. And I'll come and inspect your, your sites and what's happening. Thank you for that. We've got a couple of interesting questions coming through, but I think we'll take them at the end of the um, of the presentation. So we're going to go straight to, to, to Faraz. Faraz, thank you very much for your time. I know you're a very busy guy, but um, you know, you're talking to a very nice audience in South Africa, and um, I think it was worth your while. Thank you very much. Thanks, Magnus. Um, good, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, of course, I want to thank Brenthus for this kind invitation and opportunity. I am truly humbled. And indeed, I am very happy to connect to the 340 plus um, attendees from South Africa to, to, to this webinar. Um, briefly, for the benefit of those who may not know, the EDB is actually the apex body of the government of Mauritius. We operate under the aegis of the Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning and Development. Our mandate is predominantly threefold. First, we advise the government on long-term economic and strategic planning and policies. Um, second, we act as a main institution responsible for the country branding. And third, we promote Mauritius as an attractive um, investment and business center, a competitive export platform, um, as well as an international financial center of choice and repute. So I have accordingly divided my expose into three parts, um, namely our work and leave schemes, the changes brought to the family office schemes and our trust and foundations legislation um, quite recently, and I think it made quite a buzz um, in, in South Africa amongst the wealth management community. And lastly, I will touch a little bit on the anti-money laundering and combating of financing of terrorism, short AML CFT laws. Um, and I think Gavin touched a little bit on that on the EU list, but I'll talk on the FATF uh, gray list and by consequence, the EU blacklist. So without further ado, as, as you may be aware, the Minister of Finance, Economic Planning and Development presented his budget speech 2021, 2022, uh, last 11th of June. This is our equivalent to the State of the Union address. Um, and it was done against a challenging economic back backdrop. Um, this year's budget um, title was Better Together, which was focused strongly on um, recovery, revival, and resilience. So there are a number of components that he touched upon in his um, budget speech, but we are going, I'm going to pick up um, a couple of them to try and make sense uh, for our attendees today. So when it comes to work and live in Mauritius, um, what we have sought to do at the level of the government as enumerated by the Honorable Minister of Finance is to bring forward more possibilities for qualified and experienced professionals um, who are eager, of course, to avail, to avail themselves of opportunities presented in the thriving uh, job market of Mauritius, but also to take opportunities of coming here uh, to live and conduct the affairs of their businesses. So 
investors, um, professionals may opt to invest, work, um, leave, retire in Mauritius through various avenues. I'm going to enumerate them. They can either be occupation permits, um, the residence permits, permanent residence permit, um, the family occupation permit, the premium visa, uh, the young professional occupation permit, and the premium investor certificates, amongst others. Um, a lot of a lot of word and, and, and buzzwords, but uh, I'm going to try and paint the picture of what each of these terminologies actually represent. First, the occupation permit is what we call the combined work and residence permit. It allows foreign nationals to work and reside in Mauritius under three distinct categories. First one is as an investor, second one is as a professional, and third one, third one is as, an, uh, as a self-employed. Now, following the budget speech of last year and this year, we have had some fundamental changes. First, um, previously the occupation permit was valid only for three years. Now, once you're granted an occupation permit by the Economic Development Board in those three categories, it's valid for 10 years. Secondly, as a holder of occupation permit, you used to be able to have your dependents come to live and reside with you in Mauritius. There was an age limit of 24 years, 24 years of age. We have waived that maximum age limit for dependents. Therefore, your dependents can be of any age. Thirdly, we have introduced a new category called the 10 years uh, family occupation for permit for those contributing in excess of $250,000 um, in the COVID-19 Projects Development Fund. And under this scheme, you, it's a family occupation permit, your spouse do not need um, um, separate uh, permission to, to reside and work in Mauritius. Now, what we have also done is we have allowed non-citizens um, occupation permit holders under the self-employed category to also incorporate a one-man company and to employ administrative um, staff. Um, the monthly salary, which is ac applicable for an occupation permit for professionals, have been brought down to 30,000 of rupees per month, uh, which is a bit less than $1,000 um, as salary for the professionals, but this is limited to fund accounting and compliance services for a company holding a license from the regulatory body in Mauritius. Um, at the same time, people working in the field of uh, ICT, they also can have a, um, a, a monthly salary of 30,000 Mauritian rupees. For others, it is currently 60,000 Mauritian rupees. Now, moving on to the next one, we have what you call a permanent residence permit. Now, uh, the permanent residence permit allows you to reside in Mauritius. Um, we used to, to have the permanent residence permit for a 10 years period. So once you're given a PRP, you're allowed to come freely in Mauritius to reside in Mauritius for a period of, 20, of 10 years. We have amended now this age, um, this time um, factor to 20 year period. So you have, um, you have the ability once you have a PLP, for instance, Joel mentioned if you're acquiring, uh, Joel and Gavin mentioned if you're acquiring um, an immovable property in Mauritius in excess of $375,000, um, you get a PLP. Now that PLP is for a period of 20 years. And now once you come in Mauritius, if you feel that you wish to not only reside in Mauritius, but you wish to also work in Mauritius or you wish to be employed by a company working in Mauritius, you have the flexibility um, to, to, to shift between your permanent residence permit to switch category to become an investor occupation permit or a professional occupation permit. We have also introduced a new category called the young professionals. This is um, a permit that is um, issued to, um, to a young professional, of course, for a contract of employment for a period of three years. Um, now, um, that is predominantly for a community of students who come to Mauritius and study in Mauritius. 
um, and then they have the ability to get a, a, a job in Mauritius and they stay for a period of, of three years after the completion of their studies. Um, there is another category as well that we have introduced called a premium visa. Now, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we introduced the premium visa to allow non-citizens to experience the exotic lifestyle offered by Mauritius and to be able to come here and work remotely. Um, the, 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 the premium visa allows holders to stay and work in Mauritius for a period of one year, which is actually renewable. Um, it is open to citizens from over 110 countries. Um, they can either come as tourists, as digital nomads, as retirees, as investors, as business professionals, or even as parents of children who are actually studying in Mauritius. Um, to, to, to qualify for the premium visa, it's quite straightforward. You have to show your long stay plans in Mauritius. You need to have your travel and health insurance. Um, you, you should give a commitment that you're not going to enter the Mauritius labor market, of course, because if you wish to enter into the labor market, you need to shift um, to the occupation permit. Uh, and then you need to have your um, a proof of uh, source of income and how you're going to reside in Mauritius. Now, in terms of, uh, of tax treatment, um, money that is spent through the use of foreign cards or debit cards in Mauritius by holders of premium visa will not be liable to tax. Um, as is the rule in the Income Tax Act, any person um, staying in Mauritius for more than 183 days becomes a tax resident in Mauritius per year, 183 days or more in the country, they become a tax resident. But um, the money that they are using uh, through their cards, that's not going to be, to be taxed. If they are not going to remit uh, the income that they are going to derive from outside of Mauritius to Mauritius, again, there's no remittance, therefore there, there, there is no, no, no taxation. Now, deposits made by a premium visa holder in a bank account in Mauritius, that would be liable to income tax unless um, there is a declaration that the required tax has already been paid in the country of origin or residents. But just to give you a couple of statistics, um, since we launched that uh, premium visa category in November of last year, we have already received over 2,000 queries and we have already granted uh, approximately 1,000. Uh, uh, we have already received 1,000 applications and we have granted approximately 80% of premium visas um, for, uh, for, for, for non-citizens. Now, um, there is, in terms of investors, and I know there is a, a, a huge um, investing community connected to this webinar today, over and above what uh, Joel, Magnus, and, and Gavin mentioned uh, with regard to acquisition of pro properties and to also invest in, uh, in properties and, uh, and high-end luxury residences in Mauritius, uh, we also have um, opened up uh, incentives for premium investors. So those are investors who are going to invest in innovative fields such as high-tech manufacturing, medical, biotechnological, and pharmaceutical industries. Um, it's quite a, an a la carte system that is done between the investor and the EDB. If the investment project is in excess of 500 million rupees, uh, or it relates to a project of pharmaceutical and medical devices, therefore there's no minimum requirement of investment, um, that investor can negotiate with us to get um, a, a panoply of benefits and, and facilities such as exemptions. So I'm going to name a few uh, that in premium investor certificate would allow rebates exemptions and preferential rates in relation to taxes, duties and fees under any laws in Mauritius. They will get facilities such as grants and exemptions in relation to land and buildings, infrastructure, etc. cetera. Um, the ability to, to appoint as many uh, foreign expats as, as they wish to. In any case, there is no performance requirement in Mauritius, so there is no requirement to, in, to, to, to employ Mauritians when you're setting up 
uh, a company in Mauritius. You may be required by certain statutes to have residents, but those residents can also be non-citizens. Um, now, moving on to my third page about um, what I said I'm going to articulate about the trust and foundations, you know, um, just in, in, very, in, in a very candid way. Um, Mauritius is used by a number of, 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 of exceptionally affluent people and high net worth individuals um, for wealth management and you know, to, to do their trust and estate planning through Mauritius entities, through Mauritius Trust and Mauritius Foundations. Most of the settlers um, um, or the, 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 the person setting up the foundations are non-residents, the trustees, um, or the board administering the foundations are residents in Mauritius and the ultimate beneficial owners are outside of Mauritius. So they used to be able to have a certificate of declaration of non-residents for the trust and the foundations. Therefore, they were liable to nil taxation. Therefore, they were not liable to any taxation in Mauritius. Now, this specific provision was amended in the Income Tax Act. Therefore, a trust and foundation is liable to taxation, but in the case that it used to be as it was in the past, therefore, uh, the settler of the trust is not a resident of Mauritius. The majority of beneficiaries are not resident in Mauritius, um, and the trust is, is, is administered in Mauritius. There is a statement of practice that says that for those purposes, uh, especially if the, if, if the settlers are, are not Mauritians, uh, for instance, they are South Africans, the management and control of those trusts would be outside of Mauritius. And because the management and control of the trust is outside of Mauritius, any revenue, any income that is going to be accrued to those trusts and foundations is not going to be tax liable in Mauritius. Um, and again, the changes in our fiscal legislations regarding trusts and foundations, it has um, no bearing or no consequences um, to, to, to any revenue authorities or reserve banks outside of Mauritius. I think that was mentioned in, in one, or, one or two articles in South Africa. Now, so as I said, there is a value proposition for high net worth individuals or the exceptionally affluent to, to park their wealth in Mauritius, to grow their wealth in Mauritius, to have Mauritian entities, trusts and foundations to hold their uh, worldwide assets. Um, especially for, for estate planning purposes. Um, so that stays the same. Over and above this, over, over and above trust and foundations, we have also introduced what we call the family office schemes. So again, these are for high net worth individuals. How do we define how net worth individuals? Simple, if you have a minimum investable wealth of uh, more than $5 million, we uh, consider you as a high net worth individual and you're able to set up a family office in Mauritius as a single family office, or you're able to, to, have, a, to have your um, wealth to be managed by a multiple family office. Now, for both the multi-family office and the single family office, the revenue that they derive from administering um, the, the investments, asset, all, all estates, all concierge services, um, all those revenue um, have a tax holidays. It used to be for five years. We have, ex we have extended it to 10 years. So you're able to, all those revenue that is derived by family office is not tax in Mauritius for a period of, uh, of, of 10 years. Um, and, uh, and you know, you can use your family office, both single and multifamily office to hold, um, to, to, to manage international assets and funds. Um, the exception, the exemption of, of, of tax for a period of 10 years um, is actually um, shall be valid uh, at the time that the company was incorporated in Mauritius. Now, lastly, uh, with regard to the gray list and blacklist issue when it comes to anti-money laundering laws and combating of financing of terrorism laws, um, you know, I'll take the story a bit back. Um, uh, in February 2020, Mauritius was placed on uh, the list of jurisdictions under increased monitoring of the Financial Action Task Force, um, which is predominantly the light gray list of the FATF. 
Now the FATF gave us gave us until uh, uh, um, 2022 to bring in uh, regulatory changes in certain areas of our AML CFT laws. Uh, but then in the meantime, we were already placed uh, on the EU high, uh, on the EU blacklist building upon the FATF gray list. Um, so the government said, you know, we are going to prepare all the, all the uh, regulatory changes that we needed to do, uh, and we are going to do it quite fast. And this is what has been done within less than a year. Uh, we have already um, implemented um, a number of regulatory and policy changes. And then we submitted uh, um, our case to the FATF uh, in June. 2021 by what is called the plenary session at the FATF. Now, there are two ways that the FATF looks at it. First, it looks at what have been the strategic deficiencies that it said um, a specific country had, a particular country had. And then during the plenary session, it sees whether it has made significant progress or not. Um, if it has made, if that country has made significant progress, um, the plenary session asked their on-site inspectors to go to that country and check whether what they have asserted or claimed on their report, if it is actually true or not. So it is already, you know, the, 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 the quasi step for exit. So this is what happened in Mar for Mauritius, in the case of Mauritius. So in the June 2021 plenary session, the, um, the, the, the FATF, endorsed the substantial and swift progress made by Mauritius, uh, and then it warranted an on-site inspection. The FATF's on-site assessors were in Mauritius uh, last September, uh, from the 13th to the 15th of September, and then they are going to submit their report, which is going to corroborate whatever Mauritius has asserted um, uh, for the plenary session of FATF next month. No, sorry, this month actually. So the, the plenary session will be from the 17th to the 22nd of, of October. So, you know, we, Mauritius has significantly um, completed the FATF action plan well ahead of the agreed uh, deadline of 2022. Uh, this endorsement by the FATF bears testimony to the reforms undertaken by Mauritius and by the government of Mauritius and by the number of authorities. So we are hoping uh, for a positive review in the next plenary session uh, of the FATF. And I have to say it is consequential or, or even axiomatic once you have already been, you have a, once you exit the FATF list, you would automatically uh, or, or quite, quite um, consequently exit uh, the EU list as well. Um, so those have been uh, my submissions, uh, Magnus. So over to you now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Faraz. You, you covered a lot of a lot of ground there, but that's why we've got Gavin on the island for three specific questions. So I'm going to spend about five minutes before we wrap up um, on on some very interesting questions that have come through, and I'm going to combine one question. A couple of questions have been repeated. One is uh, about schooling. The one, uh, secondly, hospitals, medical care. Thirdly, um, the, there was a question, what, how big is the Afrikaans community in, in Mauritius? And Gavin, you can comment on that. And so let's ask Joel about the schooling situation uh, uh, on, the, on the island. Uh, thanks, Magnus. Um, no, but, but you have two systems here. I mean, you have three, three systems. One, which is the... Um, Cambridge-based um, uh, schooling, where you get your A-levels. And now more and more, uh, we've seen the international baccalaureate as well coming on board. And uh, this morning, I heard from the radio that it, it looks like that's a standard that might be adopted uh, from now on for our school living certificate. On the other side, on the other side, there is a proper French schooling system, <laughs> the one I've been to myself, and uh, which is basically funded uh, on a big chunk by the French government. So when you leave that after, you know, when you get to 17, 18 years old, and it's equivalent of matric or potentially matric plus, plus one year, you know, which is basically the equivalence. And um, yeah, so that's basically the school system. In the smart cities, typically, uh, as far as Medin is concerned, we have West Coast, um, 
international school, which is established here. So it provides uh, primary up to secondary. And uh, we have next door a middle section university as well. So basically it's just across the road. And, but we're also looking for um, uh, school operators. I've been talking myself lately to some leading South African uh, school, uh, school uh, operators, which I've, I've clearly voiced out of interest to move down to Mauritius as well. But obviously, for obvious reasons, we cannot bring the metric over. They will have to adopt either the Cambridge A level or, or the IB, you know, which will become, I believe, the, the de facto standard. Yeah, I mean, you've got two kids at school. Maybe you can relate your experience with your young kids. I'm quite sure you had the same concerns, questions, when you and mommy and, and, and the kids landed there four years ago. What was your experience and how the kids settled in? Um, Magnus, they've, they've actually, uh, initially, uh, I think uh, learning uh, French was a little bit of a challenge, um, but they've overcome that hurdle and uh, because that becomes now your second language uh, at, at the school that they're at. Uh, it's an international school, as Joel mentioned, it's a Cambridge education. So primarily, uh, all, the, all the subjects are taught in English and uh, French being your second language. So they learned a new language which was quite nice. And um, they've, they've um, integrated very well. I mean, you're getting students from South Africa, Mauritius, uh, and as I said, there's from 70 different countries. So it's, it's quite, quite nice to, to have that international exposure with other, other children from around the world. If I can just add that question about the Afrikaans community on the island. I mean, half of your family is Afrikaans and they're there as well. What, what is their experience? Yeah, that is. So, uh, those by Afrikaans means of the island. So you're not going to feel like uh, you're alone. There's definitely a lot of uh, Afrikaans speaking, uh, or there is an Afrikaans speaking community, and they, they, they're very well met and they get on very well. So definitely uh, Afrikaans is spoken on the island uh, quite a bit as well. For us, a question perhaps for your side is, is flights from South Africa and specifically flights from Cape Town again. Maybe you can fill us in on what's happening with the um, business rescue of Air Mauritius. And, 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 and maybe you know, will there be direct flights again from Cape Town to Mauritius, which was very popular prior to the lockdown? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure if it, it will be Cape Town, but I know that uh, we are looking for a flight as well to South Africa. So I think flights have resumed. Um, it's predominantly to Johannesburg, but the flight from Johannesburg actually connects to through Cape Town into Mauritius. So I know, I mean, we are looking for a flight in November to Johannesburg and it, and it connects. So that's one way, the direct flight. There is another, uh, the, the, the couple of other routes. One is of course from Dubai Emirates, but that's um, a long one. Uh, there's another one from uh, Réunion Island, so Mauritius to Réunion Island, Réunion Island to uh, Cape Town. Uh, and then there is one more from uh, Mauritius to Nairobi, Nairobi to Johannesburg slash Cape Town. I might also add that Flight Safair, which is one of our, which is the, the local airline, which is basically taken over in terms of, of, of size in South Africa, they've announced two days ago uh, uh, twice weekly flights from OR Tambo to Mauritius, which has been welcomed by a lot of people. So the flights are opening up for those people concerned about that. Yeah. One other question, um, and again, for us, maybe you, you can comment. Um, certain gentlemen ask, with so little tax income, what kind of infrastructure does the island have, i.e. hospitals, roads, ESCOM, telecom, and maybe where, where, does, where does the island get its electricity from? Maybe just a comment on that. Uh, where does the island get its electricity? There are a couple of, uh, of uh, hydropower plants over and above that. Um, there are PPP agreements with um, sugar industries and um, to they use coal. Uh, one is coal, the other one is uh, uh, molasses, actually, yeah, uh, for the production of, of electricity. But you're not familiar with uh, um, um, blackouts and load shedding and stuff like that on the island? No, no, there, 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 no, no, there, there is no load shedding, uh, absolutely not. There is no load shedding on the island, uh, and they have. 
there are no blackouts, not, not that uh, at least in my existence I've been privy to. That'll be wonderful. If you want, I can, I can intervene on that because Medina as well is looking at uh, uh, sustainable um, energy, you know, like a green energy. And uh, typically today, the country runs on uh, HFO or coal, eh? typically like uh, to generate uh, its, its electricity. Uh, but uh, more and more uh, bagasse, which is the fiber coming from is being used as well as as a um, as fuel, you know. So it's move. We are gradually moving into a, a more like green energy platform. Government in its in its policy, as as is wishing at least to get sixty percent of electricity should come from a sustainable mix. It's a bit of a challenge, I must say. But now uh, many tenders came out uh, for companies like ourselves and others to participate to these bids, whereby we'll use either wind energy or solar energy. To complement the mix, you know, and and to gradually move into a more a more greener platform. But uh, as as Faraz is saying, essentially today it's coal and HFO, some fiber in terms of biomass in the sugar industry is burning biomass to generate electricity. But as well, wind and uh, sun are coming more and more now onto onto the forefront. Yeah, just Thanks. just to complement on this, uh, just to complement on this one as well, Ruben, above what you said, um, there's also um, a, a quasi kind of agreement that was opened up by the utilities company in Russia. So if you have photovoltaics on your um, on your houses, for instance, individual houses, you're able to connect to the grid uh, and 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 deduct the surplus that you produce. So they are opening up, huh, like you said, uh, for um, energy mix. <laughs> Well, that's good news. Uh, Gavin, many questions about the cost of living. Um, just a comment or two about what does it cost generally to, to live in the island if, you know, groceries, um, motor car, entertainment. Just give us a broad ballpark figure on, on cost of living relative to South Africa. Um, Magnus, look, it's a good question. We do get it quite often, um, bearing in mind that your, your tax rates are a lot lower. So there's sort of a, an offset in terms of cost of living and, and tax that's payable here in Mauritius. We do find that uh, the cost of living is higher. There's no doubt about it, be it schooling, entertainment, uh, food. We do Im uh, Mauritius does import quite a bit of uh, products. They do manufacture a, a lot of local products as well, but... Uh, unfortunately, being a small island, they need to, to import as well. So the cost of living is higher. Um, but again, there's a bit of an offset in terms of the tax incentives and rebates that we get on that as well. I'd like to add to that, and, and we've assisted many, many clients who have moved to Mauritius, where we would ex externalize their assets prior to their move to Mauritius and create a dollar-based or a euro-based investment portfolio, which is protected them and in fact made them money. If you had invested in dollars five years ago, your, your purchasing power today in Mauritius is substantially higher. So the one thing that you cannot do in my view is move to Mauritius and then have your, your assets tied up in South African rands because that will make life very expensive. Uh, so that's where we assist uh, structuring these portfolios either in Mauritius or in Guernsey or whatever the case might be. We've been doing it for many years, it works very easy. You can open a bank account with, as I mentioned earlier, AfriAsia, MCB, Vestec, APSA, and you can link your investment portfolio in Guernsey with that card, and it just gets paid across into your income, which you use to spend in Mauritius. And then, of course, there's no, there's no land tax in, in Mauritius, which is a big saving. I think things like insurance is much cheaper because crime is lower. And you also, a lot of foodstuffs like fish and, and, and vegetables are cheaper in my view than in South Africa. It's the delicious imported stuff that comes in bottles that's much more expensive than the biltong and the big steaks. But there's a trade-off and my experience is you add about 10, 15% to your cost of living in South Africa, which tells you what you would be expecting to spend in Mauritius. We're running out of time. There's still many questions. There's one more question, which I think that needs to be answered. Medical care. Um, Devin, again, you had experience. Lots of South African doctors on the island. Maybe you just want to comment on that. 
A hundred percent. There's a lot of professionals moving to the island. Um, so there's a lot of talent coming through. There's a lot of local professionals as well, very talented as well. Um, so there's international medical um, schemes that you can uh, join or there's local um, medical schemes as well. So it's, it's really dependent on, on your needs as a family, but there's definitely an offering either way. I mean, your, uh, the website where people can make contact there too, the one is the general one, which is invest at rent, renterswealth.coza, or the one for yourself on the island is Gavin B at brentwealth.mu. Um, and I'm sure you're going to be inundated with queries and questions. And if people are looking for office space, storage space on the island, Gavin is the go-to guy. There is, it's going to become a requirement if you want to set up. So the starting point is Gavin and the team, Yolanda, his wife, and other members of the team there. I'd like to thank our, our, our speakers, Faraz, uh, Joel, and Gavin. But I'd like to also thank the more than 350 people who started this presentation and currently 270. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I think it's worth your while to investigate either as a holiday destination, investment destination, or a plan B, it doesn't matter, but speak to our team on the island. And I'd like to thank our media team who put together this webinar. And for me, I'm saying goodbye to you. Cheerio. Yes. Thank you very much. Cheers. 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 Bye. Cheers.